Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, October 28th, 2021. I am Bill Hainer, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all members of the persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Ms. Exton. Here. Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Mr. Thielman. Here. Dr. Rampy. Because I'm a host. And I can't get you being a host. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cardin isn't here yet. Ms. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Dr. Holman. She's, she's I'm, I'm here, but I'm trying to get on my computer. Okay, that's okay, as long as you can hear us. Dr. McNeil. Yes, I can hear you. Mr. Spiegel. Yes. Mr. Mason. Here, yes. Uh, Ms. Elmer, she's not here. Okay. Uh, Arlington Educational Association representative, Ms. Keyes. Here. And student representative, Megan Carmody. Or Amy Shalou. Okay. We'll just go from there. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington. Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with the act signed into law on June 16th, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of the Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with the agenda materials on the town's website, this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, the meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record for the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. We will now have public comment. And I'm, I'm gonna read a brief statement before I uh, let the people speak. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 30 minutes of public comment, depending on the number of people who sign up. Now, school committee, re uh, let, let me begin this again. For members of the public who wish to address committee, there will be 30 minutes of public comment, depending on the number of people who sign up Time allotments may be reduced, but will not exceed three minutes each. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 30 minutes, the number of speakers will be capped and will be invited to speak based on timestamp of their emails to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera, if possible, while speaking, and to adhere to the public comment policy, BEDH, that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticism of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any members of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in the capacity as the operational leader of the Arlington school, Public Schools. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. If you would like to sign up to speak, please email uh, Ms. Diggins. The email is uh, on our website. Is Mr. Swain here? If he is, can you let him in? Uh, Mr. Hainer, Sean has his hand raised. I don't know if he wanted to say something. Okay. Uh, James Swan, can you uh, can you let him come in as a panelist, please? He's under the attendees. Who is who is our host right now? There you are, James. 
Yes, I'm you're here. On. Yep, you're on. We can hear you. We can see you. Thank you. James Swan, 35 Windsor Street. I attended the Curriculum and Accountability Subcommittee meeting on Monday. I support the goal of getting as many students as possible to engage in deep honors level work, regardless of racial or ethnic heritage, English proficiency level, or economic background. I think this is admirable and achievable. I really appreciated the care and the questions asked by the school committee members during this meeting. I, were also, I also found the presentation from APS and their expert collaborator on heterogeneous classes, those that mix honors and non-honor students disappointing. The description of outcomes for the experiment with freshman heterogeneous classes during the last remote school year and the subsequent discussion was not up to the standard I would expect. As an example, one common worry for parents is that heterogeneous classes will lower the educational standards at the high school. APS does not do differentiated instruction well at any level, in my opinion. This concern was answered by a teacher comment, quote, we have kids who are good at math class, but are not good at math, end quote. The implication is that there's something wrong with the kids that only a major change to the instructional model can fix. Some of us will send our children to Arlington Public Schools 180 days a year for 13 years. This teacher's assessment, which APS emphasized, is that kids are not good at math. The responsibility lays squarely at the feet of the educators, not the kids. They reflect the values inculcated by their teachers who have exclusive control of the classroom. Answering this concern from parents by claiming that our students are not already well served by APS does not give me confidence in the process going forward. Parents deserve a clear plan for how any future heterogeneous classes are going to work. It should anticipate and answer many questions, including on what model of differentiated instruction will this program be based? Which other districts in Massachusetts have implemented it? How did they know this approach was better? How will we know the same? How can we trust the district to assess this honestly? APS only now tells us that learners in their honors classes are, quote, not good at math. The standard for discussion of this major change and the planning and evidence to support it needs to be much higher than it is right now. I think that EPS can expect parents will show them respect by reading their plans carefully and critically and by providing constructive feedback. APS officials should show parents and the representatives on the school committee respect too and come properly prepared for these future conversations. APS should also share publicly all the survey data collected on the freshman experiment last year. I've had other parents reach out to me privately wanting to discuss this issue, but afraid of being cast into social disgrace for being perceived as not on board with what has been declared an equity initiative. I think that's wrong. No one should be afraid to speak their mind for fear of social retribution. A good plan from APS should be able to be discussed openly and its merits should be evident. I also think this is, problem is not helped when what is considered equitable in this situation is left ill-defined. The district makes, needs to take the lead in setting a definite standard for what they think constitutes fairness. That standard is not clear now, and this ambiguity can be deployed unproductively. For example, the district presentation noted that participation rates and honors grew for all racial demographics during the remote year. Growing honors should be counted as a success, but the rates of growth were not the same across all demographics. In fact, the fraction of Black students making up the honors cohort shrank by about 15%. This is a growing disparity in representation and could be perceived as a moral failure. Also, grades at the high school were up overall last year. This was true of students working for honors credit in heterogeneous classes. However, grades were flat among students for working for regular credit in the same classes. These students underperformed compared to their peers. This should be concerning, and perhaps more so because Black, Hispanic, and economically disadvantaged students are overrepresented among this group. By one measure, these students were not as well served by the experiment with heterogeneous classes. More to the point, these kinds of statistical analysis should not be undertaken lightly and then imbued with moral power. It's not enough to simply state that the new model is more equitable than the previous one. In fact, that shuts down discussion and limits the scope of feedback. Our community must decide together what fairness looks like, or better yet, what values we want to see reflected in the level and style of instruction provided to all our students. I think that clear goals and standards of assessment and real openness on the part of the district to parental feedback are a necessary part of doing that well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Uh, would somebody please admit Ms. Culverhouse?
She's well set. Okay. Ms. Culverhouse, she, we have you. Here you Thank go. you. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me tonight. My name is Lynette Culverhouse. I live at 24 Draper Avenue. I'm a town meeting member and a retired teacher and school administrator. I submitted a statement at the last meeting in hopes of hearing a response from you, but not one of you responded. I refuse to believe that this is because you don't care about this issue. A black student at one of our schools was given a suspension for something he didn't do. I know this boy, he is a gentle, kind soul who only wants to be accepted and to feel safe. This is no longer the case for him. He is being maligned by both adults and students. It appears the word of a white student was believed while the word of my friend's son was not. But if this child were white, would the outcome be the same? If he were the son of a town leader, would it have been handled in the same way? Here are some of my questions. Do our school leaders realize that a suspension goes on a child's permanent record and that for black boys, this is the start of a school to prison pipeline? Arlington is a largely white town with mostly white leadership and a Eurocentric culture. It is therefore understandable that our white leaders may not understand the challenges and struggles that black families have to face every day living in a white culture. It is not understandable, however, that our leaders are not informing themselves or showing a willingness to listen to, believe, and value the voices of our black residents. I'm asking you to change this. The data reveals that black students in Arlington receive suspensions at a greater rate than white students. How are we addressing this? Why were the parents informed at 5.15 p.m. on a Friday that a hearing would be held at 9.15 a.m. on the following Monday, whether they could show up for it or not? This is so insensitive to a family's work situation. Why was the report that was read at the hearing not provided to the parents in spite of several requests for it? Why was only one other person allowed into the meeting with the parents? Is this legal? Why was there not a facilitated conversation between the two boys to help them resolve this disagreement? How can we expect our children to be problem solvers or resolve conflicts if we aren't modeling it for them? When will we move from a punitive approach to a restorative approach? Why were only other students interviewed about this incident and not the supervising adults or the school nurse? And it appears each student's story differed. So how was the assumption made that the black student was guilty? There was no evidence. The principal himself admitted there was no malintent and that the stories were not consistent, but he gave him a punitive suspension anyway. Why, what for? This was not explicit. Why was there no consequence for the other child involved? He was doing something that was against school policy. I know it's hard to look at, but this is what institutional racism looks like. I'm asking the school committee to please address this. The family deserves an apology and the suspension needs to come off his record. It would not have happened to a white student, in particular, a privileged white student. I'd also like the committee to know that I am a friend of the family. I'm not naming names because I don't want their reputation further tarnished by parents and children who make assumptions and gossip. I'm doing this of my own accord. No one has asked me to do it. I'm doing it because I'm trying to walk the walk when it comes to equity and undoing systemic racism. Please take this in that spirit. Thank you. Dr. Ampey. Thank you. I am not questioning. I'm asking why this was allowed to continue because of the concern of identifying the student, not for any other reason. Um, I felt that I, I don't understand. So that's all. I'm not okay. speaking to the topic. Okay. I just want to make it clear that it is the school committee's uh, position not to enter into a dialogue at this time. We do listen to the people that speak at this time and if, if there is a concern by a member, they will bring it with, to the administration uh, offline. This is not an agenda item. Um, 
Ms. Dre had in indicated that she wanted to speak, but I don't see her listed right now as an attendee. I don't see her either. So, okay, I am going to move on uh, at this time. Right now, we have uh, Arlington student representatives of the school committee, uh, Dr. Homan. I did not have anyone indicated as a student rep, so we'll pass on that one. Okay, um, we have Jazz Education uh, Conference proposal, Dr. Holman. Um, Ms. Diggins is the staff member from our, actually, um, I do see that Dr. Jenger is here, so I can let him begin, but I think we also had a staff member from Arlington High School who was yes, going to actually attend and be mm -hmm. here. Roberto yeah. D'Agostino was also here. here. Oh, he's here. Okay. I did go. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to actually hand this uh, request off to them. It's a proposal that they have sent to me, and we wanted to make sure that the committee was aware of it and had a chance to ask any questions. So go ahead, Dr. Jenker. So uh, Mr. D'Agostino can speak more to the actual program. Uh, this is, we had an opportunity, which we have had before um, because of our wonderful programs to participate um, at a conference in Texas. Um, and that does involve students traveling out of state um, and overnight, which according to our school committee policy, you are required to approve. So um, I, other than giving a massive shout out to our instrumental music program and Mr. D'Agostino, I'm gonna turn it over to him so he can tell you about the program and the planning. Your microphone's not on, Sabato. Is it, on, is it on now? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Uh, thank you uh, so much. So I'm going to try to be brief. I sent a proposal via um, email. Uh, basically, the Honors Orchestra was accepted to participate at this uh, jazz uh, uh, conference, and it's an international conference where all these uh, uh, international jazz musicians come from all over the world. And it was really hard to, to pass. Uh, and of course, uh, because of the COVID restrictions, unfortunately, uh, the, this, this festival can allow only five students to participate in our orchestra. It, it is uh, unfortunate. And as I described in our, in our proposal, uh, we are going to have, if, of course, after your approval, if you can approve, of course, uh, we're going to need to do uh, auditions to have uh, five students to participate. As always, like we have done in the past 19 years when we have traveled in Europe and in the United States, we are going to do fundraisers to help the people that they might not be able to afford this trip. And uh, PAPA, which is the Parents uh, Association of the Performing Arts, uh, has agreed to help in case this trip uh, can, uh, can happen. And uh, as I, I've also um, attached to uh, the email I sent to the school committee, uh, the COVID uh, guidelines that uh, the, this uh, conference uh, follows, and they're very, very strict, of course, that they, in other words, we're going to follow the high school um, guidelines, the, the, the flights guidelines, and of course, the, 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 the COVID guidelines written by the, uh, this uh, conference. Uh, yes, like Dr. Jenger said, that this is a, an incredible, incredible musician, music uh, opportunity. And of course, I'm here to propose it to you. And I, I hope uh, you can approve this, this trip. And thank you. Yes. Mr. Thielman. I move approval of this trip, and I congratulate Mr. Diagostino on his excellent teaching and leadership that got us this far. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have this opportunity were it not for him. So. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion by members of the committee? Seeing none, I'll take a roll call. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ampey. I'm sorry. I think it's a wonderful opportunity, but I'm concerned that the it does not require vaccination, um, that a, no, a negative COVID test before can be enough. Um, and I'm uh, I see that Dr. Jenger has his hands up if he's speaking to this. Dr. Jenger. Yeah. Um, so as a rostered extracurricular, the 
participating students would be required by us to be vaccinated. They're not required by the conference. Okay, I, I guess in my opinion, Texas has not been doing COVID well. I am reluctant given everything to send our students even vaccinated into that situation, especially since they are not requiring all the students who participate. I, I understand ours will be vaccinated, but the other ones are not. So I'm going to vote against it. I'm sorry, I'm a small sport. I think it sounds great, but if it was here, that'd be great. Just to clarify, the conference requires vaccination and testing. It's in the document I sent to Ms. Dick Diggins. Is it in the updated one? I'm sorry, I didn't. There are two documents, one my proposal and the other one from the conference. The conference requires a vaccination and or testing from everyone whoever walks into this conference, which is going to be a bubble. Right, right. and I'm saying testing is not enough. They need vaccination. And, and it wasn't, I'm saying if the updated, is it? it doesn't, it's or. So I don't think negative test is enough. I understand. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak to this? Hey, uh, on the motion uh, for the uh, trip, uh, Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Dr. Rampey. No. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Uh, Exton. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I vote yes. It passes uh, six to one. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully you'll take a lot of pictures and bring them back to us and uh, share them with us when you get back. Thank you again for seeing me and for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, Envision Arlington, Mr. Lover. Hi, good evening, Mr. Hainer. Are you able to hear me okay? I can hear you clear as a bell. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. So um, how much time do I have realistically on the agenda? Mr. Mr. Hainer? One minute. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it in whatever you give me. Well, we we have a tight, a tight schedule, but we want to hear we want to see the program. We want to okay. we're looking forward to it. All right, great. And and Ms. Diggins, do we have the slides available or should I project them? We have the slides, but I think you should project them. I have you um, for sharing the screen. Okay, very good. I'll bring them up. <clears throat> give me just one second. Are you able to see the screen, Mr. Hanner? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll move quickly. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Scott Lever with Envision Arlington. Um, I'm uh, serving as the interim co-chair of Envision Arlington. I'm also the superintendent's representative or one of two of the superintendent's representatives on the committee. And I wanna to talk to you tonight about the town survey, the annual town survey, which many of you may have participated in, in this year or in previous years. The town survey is something that's performed annually. It's been performed annually since 1992 by Envision Arlington in collaboration with the town's planning department and many of the other town departments, including the school committee and the superintendent's office. Last year, I worked with the school committee and then Superintendent Bodie to develop a number of questions that were included on the survey. And I'll tell you a little bit about that data tonight. Bye. Just a little bit about the survey as I get started. So the survey um, this year, and, and each year it changes based on some of the topical things happening in town. In the year 2021, we covered a number of things, including looking at resilience and wellness in the face of COVID-19, diversity, equity, and inclusion, education issues and senior issues, as well as communication of town services. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the overall findings. A detailed report will be available by December of this year. And um, I'll also talk to you a little bit about some of the findings in the education section tonight. So a little bit about the survey. The survey was administered between January and March of this year. It's administered online via a web survey link, essentially a SurveyMonkey survey uh, that's used for it. 
And a uh, notice of the survey is shared each January with uh, tax bills that are, that are sent to all residents of the town. Um, in past years, we've encouraged only one member of a household to respond to the survey. We've changed the format a little bit. And in the, the last two years, we've actually encouraged multiple members of a household to submit. This year, we received approximately 3,735 responses. Some of those were incomplete and weren't included in the analysis. Um, that number is down a bit from previous years and that um, we've attributed to in part COVID. So um, I wanna go into um, some of the findings which I think the committee will find um, relevant and pertinent around wellness as well as some of the findings that we have uh, with regard to education or at least the data uh, at this point. So, in the survey, we asked a number of questions about the wellness of residents with regard to their physical, mental health, and their financial well-being in the face of COVID. So the timing of this is actually really important. The survey was administered between January and March of this year. January was really the peak uh, for Massachusetts in terms of infections. So this was done really at the height of one of the major surges of, of COVID. Um, we um, asked a range of questions, including questions about physical health, uh, mental health, and economic health and well-being. We found that 86% of respondents reported their overall physical health was either excellent or good. 87 reported that their financial health was either excellent or good, while only 66% of residents or respondents really, uh, reported their mental health with, was either excellent or good. So the mental health number was significantly lower than the physical or the financial health number. Now we don't have any benchmarks. We haven't asked this question previously, so it's hard to compare that, but it did stand out to us as being a relatively low number in comparison. A couple of other things. Um, we asked about access to medical care. Again, this was at the height of one of the major surges in the pandemic. We asked survey respondents if, if their access to medical care has been more difficult than usual. We found in the responses that 45% of those who responded said their access to routine medical care was made more difficult. That was a pretty, pretty significant finding for us. We also asked a number of questions about finances. We found, again, between January and, February, Fe January and March of last year, um, which was uh, about a year into the pandemic, fully a third of respondents in our survey in Arlington reported that they had been negatively impacted by the um, pandemic financially. That's a third of respondents. And, um, Again, uh, we asked about employment. We found that a quarter of respondents reported, uh, uh, actually, sorry, more than that, 30% of respondents reported fear of losing their job. And we found that, at, again, at that point in the pandemic, about 12% of respondents had, had uh, filed for unemployment um, in the, in the self-reported data. So again, um, really interesting and, and impactful findings about uh, the, um, the impacts that residents were feeling uh, from the pandemic uh, as of uh, earlier this year. So I wanna shift and talk uh, in a bit more detail about some of the education questions, which many of you contributed to. So thank you for that. So again, we met about a year ago and we identified a number of questions to include in the survey. And uh, I'll move forward in the slides. The questions included, how, if at all, are you connected to Arlington Public Schools? How has COVID-19 affected your need and use of childcare? How many hours per week, if any, are adults in your household supporting remote education for K-12? Have any of your APS students uh, made use of any of the mental health services in 2020? And thinking ahead for this school year, which of these services, and we listed a number, um, do you expect might be used by one or more APS students in your household? 
So I'll touch on the data and the data is part of the minutes of the meeting. On the first question, how, how if at all are you connected? Again, we had um, approximately 3,700 total responses. Um, fewer, fewer were used in the analysis. So that number is gonna move around depending upon who responded to, to what question. So you'll see that the total number of responses varies a bit. But we did have uh, 91 students uh, report data in our survey, 91 students. And we uh, opened the survey for folks 16 and older. So those would be high school students who responded. These numbers allow us to do some additional drilling into the data to look at some of the findings by these different segments. That work hasn't been done. It's something that we can do together uh, with the data going forward. And we also looked at a couple of other groups. We identified people as either current parents or future parents of a student in the system. So how has COVID-19 affected your need and use of childcare? We found that 20% um, of the total response or 46 of the people for whom this was relevant had to change their work schedule. And this was as of January to March of last year. Fully 9% or 21% of those responding as this is applicable to them said that they had difficulty finding childcare and many more had to pay additional funds for childcare. How many hours a week are you using to support uh, remote education for K to 12? Um, we found uh, that, that fully, you know, 16% of those responding, yes, they had students doing remote education were spending uh, less than five hours. And it ranges, again, up to 6% of respondents said they were spending 20 hours or more to support remote learning. Then with regard to the use of mental health services, we found that 7% um, of those responding uh, to, to, to this um, said that they were relying on guidance counselors and teachers. And then the other large group was of course, other psychotherapy or clinical resources outside of the school. So again, this one was interesting because obviously the frontline uh, frontline guidance counselors and teachers are bearing a lot of the burden of this. What do people expect to be using in terms of services going forward? Again, there's a range of answers here. Enrichment programming came across pretty high. sports. And again, this, this data is available to you and to the committee. So uh, I'll pause. If there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to ask uh, uh, Mr. Hainer as time allows. Uh, happy to answer. Okay. Um, if you could get us stop the sharing, I would be able to see my screen a little bit better. Yep, you bet. Thank you. Any of the members have any questions uh, or seeking clarifications or comments they would like to make at this time. I don't see anybody. Thank you. you. But Scott, I think you, you gave a great report. I, I, we've had the, the numbers. Uh, Dr. Holman. I just want to say I've had the um, pleasure of meeting Mr. Lever uh, not too long ago, and we've started working on some collaboration. Uh, linked to uh, the potential for some strategic planning down the road. And I know this is work that uh, he and members of the Envision Arlington team have historically been part of with the school department. And um, it's I'm looking forward to collaborating further with him, um, other members of Envision Arlington and the community as we look forward to what is to come. So thank you. Good yeah. to see you, Mr. Lieber. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. Looking forward to it as well. And, and I just want to put a plug in that, that the survey will be, of course, starting again soon for 2022. And we'll be looking to re-engage the school committee uh, around questions uh, for, the, for that uh, for the next iteration. So looking forward to that. Thank you very much for your time and efforts. Yep. You're welcome. Thank hey, you. Uh, the Gibbs uh, School Improvement Plan, uh, Madame P.M. Maxwell, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Am I allowed uh, to share my screen? Am I on to share? Ms. Ms. Diggins, would you let? Yes, everybody can share their screen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I should actually do that first. Hold on a second. Okay, good evening, everyone. Once again, thank you for having us. I am Madame Pierre Maxwell, the principal at the Gibbs School. And with me tonight is... I am Stephanie Grana, the assistant principal at the Gibbs School. Okay, and we're going to give you a very brief presentation of our SIP plan. So tonight, we're going to give you a quick overview of the Gibbs School. We're going to touch upon our wins, some of our challenges and the priorities we have for the 2021-2022 school year. We'll discuss some of the key initiatives, action steps, some of the resources to support our success, and then there'll be times for some questions and answers. Thank you. And I apologize in advance. It wasn't expected that the internet was not <laughs> gonna work at school and I am at home and I do have roommates, so we're gonna try to keep it down, but I apologize. If you hear any noises, that's not school noise. Um, so um, we are the Gibbs School. Our core values are centered around the social emotional learning. We have three keywords that we uh, drive everything we do by, which are that our students, staff, community members are understanding, unified, and unstoppable. And so we look to always putting the students at the center of what we do to take into uh, their social emotional need into account to help them feel belong so they can um, participate in their learning. Uh, we have quite a few humans that support us in this work from day to day. We have 76 of them, including our classroom teachers, the teacher assistants, school counselors, social workers, our nurse Dalton, who's a star on a day-to-day -day basis every day, uh, our building subs, our men office staff, the custodians, the cafeteria staff, everyone truly cooperate and coordinate every day, collaborates to support uh, the core values uh, that we use to uh, teach our children. We also have additional um, trailblazers at large who support us. Uh, we have after school program. We have three different after school program in the building that many of our students participate in. And of course, we are supported by our curriculum directors, uh, the school council members, um, the Go PTO, the leadership team members, uh, our amazing superintendent, her cabinet members, school committee, and of course, our fearless parents. All of these people support us directly or indirectly to drive uh, instruction and uh, create the best environment for our students at the Gibbs School. And in spite of many adjustments we had to make last school year, uh, we felt that we had an unstoppable year based on all the support of our former superintendent, Dr. Bodhi. We truly felt that uh, the year went at best as it could with all the restriction of COVID. So this is Gibbs in a nutshell, and we're gonna continue to improve on what we do centering uh, our children around social emotional learning to really support their learning. Um, so now we want to talk a little bit about our wins from um, this school year, starting this school year. We ended last school year uh, holding several virtual uh, conversation uh, with our students at the elementary school, at the all the seven elementary school. We also held a virtual presentation for our parents to kind of make a quick connection, let them know we were thinking of their students and we would spend the summer planning for the students. So um, we felt that it was a huge win having a total of 441 students in total participating in all the activities we put together with Gibbs staff through the Arlington uh, Community Education to really prepare to uh, guide out students before they enter the school uh, for the 2021-2022 school year. Uh, the assistant principal and I and the uh, coordinator of the special ed department and other support staff joined us to facilitate uh, 
conversation for the students. Uh, they came, their parent came. We had uh, 14 teachers in total that support the Trailblazer Guide for the Gibbs students under the leadership of Mrs. Kelly O'Keefe, one of the veteran uh, teachers at the Gibbs School. Uh, and currently uh, we had 76 parents who came for a conversation about the last 18 months and some of their uh, feelings, what they had learned. We had three key sections we talked about was, uh, what did they want us to consider to amplify? What are some practices they felt based on the last 18 months we should sunset? And what should we create? What innovation based on what they learned alongside their children with the school system? What can we do differently based on our experiences with COVID? And, uh, Last but not least, currently more than 50% of our staff are participating and engaging with our students in AM, PM program after school daily, simply to really help tackle all the different challenges that were co caused by co COVID and how can we uh, get back to learning and creating a, a normal as possible environment for the students. Um, Mrs. Griner, I can't see you, so I don't know if you want to add anything at the stage. No, nope, I'm good so far. Keep going. Thank you. And we wanted to share some pictures of uh, celebration and conversation we had with our students. These were some of the students who came over the summer uh, in the month of August, more precisely, uh, to connect before school started. So they had a chance to do a similar activity than what we did with their parents and also with the teachers when the teachers returned to school. So we were asking the same questions of all of our constituencies to get a sense of how to really set up for this school year and to uh, learn from what the last 18 months had taught us uh, uh, most everyone. So these are the trailblazers. You can see how comfortable <laughs> they were from hello, from coming. We created some mindful jar to give them to settle their spirits so they can really learn how to recenter themselves where, because most children even pre-COVID would get agitated coming to school. You know, uh, So we know many of them were remote. So we wanted to make sure we did some activity to get them familiar with some of us. Uh, with the leadership of the school, with many of the teachers, so the school will not be so strange to them when they arrive on uh, last September 9th. Uh, these are pictures of some of their parents who also came. Uh, this, these pictures were taken in our media centers where some of the parents collaborated with uh, myself, Mrs. Greiner, and uh, Ms. Mello, who's the new special ed coordinator at the Gibbs School. Uh, these are, and they were extremely engaging. And last but not least, we have some, okay, these pictures are actually from about three weeks ago where we did some activities with some of our trailblazers at the school, showing you how we are collaborating with the students, pausing to give them voice in different situations that's happening in the school so they can be included in some of the decision that are we, we were making that's really affecting them. So ultimately we want to really uh, collaborate with our students and work with them on finding solutions on really being hands-on on creating that belonging environment we want for every student. Um, this is some of their pictures from this school year, the la about three weeks ago. Um, see how excited they are to be at Gibbs. <laughs> and, and I think we also have some pictures of uh, our staff and professional. Okay, this, these are some uh, a staff meeting conversation. We had similar conversation for professional development and collaborating prepping to start the school year. So these are some of the wins we wanted to share uh, with you to show what's going on at the school. Lots of pictures. Okay, so they were unified from the start and we're going to co be collaborative and be understanding from hello and continue to do that throughout the school year. So now uh, with the challenges, uh, we have looked at some of the data from Arlington Public School, not just Gibbs School, but from also Arlington Public School. Uh, we focused on the last, uh, from 2017 to 2021, although this data is representing performance of sixth graders uh, by their subgrade, subgroups. Uh, so we have uh, African-American in blue, uh, black students in red, Hispanic and in yellow, green uh, is multi-race, 
and then uh, orange is white. So if you're looking at that pattern, looking at the performance of students from year to year, you notice that even when uh, everyone were not progressing, uh, we can see there was some movement going down, but the African, uh, the black students in particular have truly declined. If you look at 2017, look, they went even lower from 460 something to 463 right here. They went up a little bit in 2019 and they went down again in 2021. Uh, we did not have uh, an MCAS taking in 2020. And so, and then this is for math. Math is even a more dire situation. Uh, looking at the number again, if you're looking at the black students compared to their peer uh, from the other subgroups, again, their performance is a lot less. 2019, it looks like was a year where uh, there was growth being made by all in all the different group. And we understand that if there wasn't a COVID-19 in 2020, perhaps that trend would have continued to uh, go up, but it did not. So again, when we pause for COVID in many ways, and you look at the result for 2021, again, the black student seems to have not done as well as their counterpart. So that data is identical across the district, whether you're looking at from third grade, fourth grade, fifth, all the way to 12th grade. Consistently, black students have underperformed their multi-race peers, their Asian peers, and their white peers. And so that's one of the challenges we are um, looking at at the school. And I think also the district is looking at that through some of its plan. So uh, we met with our um, school council in looking at the SIP, how the SIP is created. And so we want to look at brainstorming around why. Why is it that across the district and of course at Gibbs School, our students are not performing uh, like uh, their peers are performing. We view a video, which I'm not going to play tonight for the committee, but you have access to it, that really set uh, us to address some situation and some challenges that people tend to be uncomfortable to discuss when we're talking about race and when we're talking about uh, some minority children not performing uh, like their peers, it's not so much that our school is not a great school. Our school is a great school. We have a lot of tools and we have many of the resources. We are creating the atmosphere, yet some of the students still are not performing. So uh, some of the questions uh, the school council members pause as after we view the videos and looking at the SIP was that, what do we think teachers should be doing? Can we look at things with a trauma-informed lens? And, and this also, this whole looking at trauma-informed lens also, it's something that our support staff are looking at. Can we view students differently, not just because of COVID, but because of the systematic way some black children are treated in society or how their parents are treated in society. It's not something that we can completely ignore when children come to school and what's in their psyche, how they're learning, how they're receiving information from us. It's not all about, it's not always about that they don't actually know how to do the work, but are they ready and open and have the capacity to take in what's being taught to them because they have so many other things that's competing in their mind about uh, learning. So we talk about, can we truly work on the concept of belonging for all students to feel safe and supported? Uh, we also ask the question, does every child feel welcome in our classroom? Give schools specifically truly centered using responsive classroom. We use uh, the MTSS framework. We have a lot of resources that center around the uh, question of our children feeling that they belong and that th so they can feel at ease and at home every time they come to school. But then does every child see himself or herself or themselves in our classroom? Uh, we also ask, does every 
um, African American or black child have access to everything we stated above, like the other students in, in the classrooms. So these are, and then last but not least, how can we uh, petition to explore the cultural biases uh, in the MCAS itself? Uh, and um, also the topic that started conversation at the Gibbs School last year about the fact that how we grade and why do we grade? What are some of the systematic ways of perhaps not putting uh, minority students on equal footage that we use through our system of grading and something that can often be quite subjective on the way that we do it. So um, these are some of the interesting conversation we've had with our school council so far on the first draft of the uh, Gibbs SIP. And so I'm really looking forward to continue to work with them for us to uh, address the elephants in the room uh, <laughs> when we are having this conversation. Do not be afraid to be vulnerable, to really say the things that often people are not saying in the, in the room. So our essential questions we're going to keep using to guide uh, the goals in those three um, uh, objectives we have in the SIP is if our school is fine the way it is, or has many of the elements of what makes a good school, why aren't all students and specifically African-American black students academic performance not comparable to that of their peers? That's a question we're gonna go back to over and over until we find something that works. So the three key initiative in a SIP uh, for Gibbs School is to create a school environment that truly fosters belonging through compassionate interaction, student to su students, staff to students, staff to staff, parent to staff, and staff to parents. The second uh, um, initiative is to expand each staff's capacity in the area of diversity, equity, inclusion, and cultural proficiency. And then the last one is to develop a yearly plan to equitably teach, support our students, and build all adults' capacity in our school slash district. Um, this, the resources we will need to support uh, a successful uh, implementation of the SIP is consultant to coordinate with the district director of DEI to help facilitate DEI professional development for Gibbs staff. Uh, we would like district or school initiative to support staff in taking the ideas course. It's a course that the district has made available uh, for uh, teachers or anyone who works in our district. We would like to see we create the, um, the possibility giving teachers time and identify the time where we can make it more appealing uh, for teachers to want to take the course. I've taken the course, it's quite intensive, it's a lot of reading, so we can see sometimes staff may have a life after work and it's very difficult to taking the course when we have not identified when is an ideal time for them to take the course. We also want to talk about space to include alignment of special education program uh, from for students from elementary school. Uh, we do have uh, some programming at Gibbs School, but they are not in alignment with what currently exists in our elementary school. So uh, we will be working on making this uh, more of a um, al alignment uh, from Gibbs, from elementary school to Gibbs and then Gibbs to Addison. And we also wanna talk about allocation of time in the school day for teachers to teachers uh, collaboration, teachers and administrators collaboration. Uh, so we can really talk about those initiatives. It's wonderful to have big initiative, but if we don't have the time specifically allocated for these collaboration to take place, it makes it difficult for us to uh, implement. We also will definitely look at what budget adjustment uh, to fund uh, some of the stated initiative. Um, I hope I didn't talk too fast, but this is our presentation. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And um, I'm going to let Mrs. Griner take all your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any of the members uh, have any questions or comments they'd like to state or share? Mr. Cardin. I'll let Jane go first for a change. All right. Ms. Morgan. Um, 
Madame Pierre Maxwell, can you, uh, I guess, let me, the, 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 uh, the MCAS data isn't in the uh, presentation that we got or the one that's in Novus. So if we could get an updated copy of that, that would be great. Um, the thing that I guess I wanted to um, ask you and Ms. Greiner about um, is that while certainly, and I, I'm not looking at the data now because I don't have it, but um, you know, <coughs> we continue to see significant disparities for subgroups of students. Um, but what is uh, sort of remarkable to me is that the large jump in achievement at the Gibbs for sixth graders that we saw the first year the Gibbs opened has continued into uh, 2021, right? So if you look, if you look at those scores over time, the first two are when sixth graders were were together in a in a much larger building down Mass Ave. Um, and then we see a, a, a pretty marked across the board, again, I'm not looking at it, but a pretty marked improvement um, in 2019, then no data for 2020, obviously, and then um, a drop in 2021, but it's, it's you know, it's commensurate. I, I, again, I, my suspicion is it's commensurate to what we saw across the district. So I guess what I'm curious about is that, you know, when, when the Gibbs opened and the decision was made to open an all sixth grade school, you know, so, something happened with student achievement when, when that, when that, when that happened with that group, right? Those sixth graders are doing better at the Gibbs in an all sixth grade environment than than they were historically. And I guess I I hope that you and your team can dig into that a little bit because I suspect that there are some lessons to be learned from that and with what you're doing that hopefully could be applied to improving achievement for all students. So I guess I'm curious if that's something that you've talked about. I appreciate it's a little wonky because we don't have that. It was 2021, um, that, you know, that 2021 data, but this is the first time that we've seen, like, it, it wasn't just an anomaly, right? That 2019 year wasn't just an anomalous jump in achievement um, for students. So I'm just curious if that's something that you guys have talked about. I, I do agree that our students, if you look at the Gibbs data itself, they are doing well. There, there is some substantial growth, but the idea is that across the district, there's, so our teachers probably have to do a much heavy lifting than that subgroup of students to get them up to par. And when you're looking at the, and if you dissect the data and look at the subgroup themselves as a school, we're doing well, but then when you zoom into the individual students, it turns that some of the students who are not doing as well happen to be those uh, African-American or black students. So that can easily get lost in the shuffle if we're looking at as a school, how are we progressing? So we are making growth. We want it to be substantial growth for all students. So these results would include equally our uh, African-American students. So, so that's the thing we have to look at. Why are, not, are they not performing equally as their peers, if they're, especially if they are of our district all along? Of, co of course. I mean, of course, that's what we want. But I guess what I'm saying is, is that I, it, I, don't, I also don't want to lose the fact that something happened in 2019 for achievement for for across each subgroups and all students, something happened that we didn't have any data for in 2020, and it was replicated by and large in 2021. And it just, you know, it seems like that that's that there may be something to learn within, you know, what you know, whatever happened when we when those kids came to an all sixth grade building, yes, not all students, like we're we're not like we certainly don't have parity across subgroups, not even close, right? And that's what we want to do. But I just am hoping that we can take some lessons from where there has been, you know, where we did see some improvement. Um and and you know hopefully use that to continue to drive future success. So that's and it. That's all you, I and I think you're trying to give us a compliment. I will graciously take it. The staff does work very hard. They are committed. 
they are engaged with the students. And so if we're just looking on the surface, I think they are doing everything that they know how to do correctly. And this is why we need to uh, find the right professional development for them. We need to look deeper into the whole concept of what, what is true inclusion look like? What is uh, What are some areas of equity? So for example, if you look at how we're grading students, even how we notice if we say a child is disruptive, is the child truly disruptive or the child's behavior is not something you are accustomed to. So I think we are on the right track at the school in regard to how do we embrace what we say, putting the student at the center, creating that growth mindset uh, framework for everyone to use, whether you are an adult or a child. And, and then yes, we can do better, but definitely uh, this school being all sixth grade, create the right atmosphere for the children to learn without many distractions they may have had if they are with their seven and eight grade peers. I, I would agree to that and give kudos to what the staff is doing. Mr. Carden. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was gonna make the same point. This is, this is the first time we've seen that data um, shown that way. Uh, and I don't know it, I mean, we have to rule out that there wasn't also improvement at, at, at Audison in a similar fa fashion in 2019. I, I don't think there was, but um, that would be interesting. But if not, if it was limited to Gibbs, and then I think somebody owes uh, Ms. Francisco a call to congratulate her for the job she and the team did in setting up that school. Um, so it is something, you know, hopefully that a, a good win for us. Um, so, Madam Pierre Maxwell, I, I understand you eliminated Project Block this year. And I, the, your new schedule isn't on the website, so I'm not quite sure what, what that looks like now. But are the, are the teachers now teaching um, five periods a day, or are they still just teaching four plus some other assignments? They are teaching five, five periods a day. Okay. Because um, the, other, the other thing facing you is, is you know, 500 students coming in next year based on the, our fifth grade size, over 500 students. So hopefully you're thinking, it sounds like that change will help um, uh, handle that, that, that level of students with the five clusters. We think so, we're, we're hoping. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, the other thing, I'm, so I'm, I'm happy, very happy to see the, um, uh, the special education focus. As Ms. Greiner knows, I have a, a, personal, <laughs> a personal history there. So um, uh, that's, that's long overdue and, and you know, it's sort of something that um, we, we may have had a lot of success in launching the, the school, but something that just um, wasn't quite settled well. Um, so I'm glad you're taking a, a look at that. In the plan though, it, it has um, four or five years in it um, for, the, for each activity. So it wasn't clear to me whether you're setting up a new process that you're going to use every year for the next few years, or if this is sort of a one-time, let's look at how we're doing it to bring it into alignment with what's above and below us. Is this, is that what you're trying to do? Well, we know that we can't just have all this happening by next school year. So first we want a process to looking at the logistic of the data, who's coming, what are they receiving to make sure that we are intentionally planning for the students and not just assume when they get to Gibbs, we'll figure it out. And then if this, then we will be looking at space and at the capacity of the current staff at the school to service the incoming class. We're also gonna be looking at the schedule, doing the schedule where we are scheduling first with special children who have those high needs and then populate the schedule around them versus the other way around. So it's a process that may take a few years. And as far as the budget is concerned, we understand every year gonna have its own flavor because we don't know how many students coming from year to year. So that's a process that once we establish it, that needs to continue it from year to year. And we hope that we can also start the process, not somewhere in the spring, but somewhere at the end of the fall. So we can be well prepared. For example, if we need to post certain position, if we need to tweak the programming at a district level to properly staff Gibbs School, that we can do this ahead of time. So we're still playing with the years, but I foresee that once it's established, it will be year in, year out to really analyzing the data that's coming in, whether it's the uh, facilities perspective or academic or uh, um, and materials for, for the program the kids will need, et cetera. So that's 
what we were hoping to do. Great, thanks. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm chair of the curriculum instruction subcommittee, basically, it's a short name. Uh, so I do hope um, once you've sort of gone through this process this year in the spring, you'll come to us and, and give us an overview of, of how that went and, and what, what you've learned from that. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. You know, I, I, a lot of what uh, I want to say has already been said. The only thing I want to do is say that just to let people recall that several years ago, we had long conversations about the sixth grade school and whether having all students in one grade was going to work, was it a good idea? And, you know, and I, and, and, and uh, Madame Pierre Maxwell uh, made great points about areas where things are going great and areas where the uh, staff and faculty recognize there, there has to be improvements. And I think that's great leadership on her part and her staff's part. But I do want to say at a high level, things are working really well. It's a good model. It's very popular in our town. And uh, kudos to the staff, administrative leadership for making the school what it is. Thank that's you. all I wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ampey. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madame Pierre Maxwell, for your presentation. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about, or at least bring to your attention. So I understand the focus on Black students and the focus on students with disabilities, and, and don't quibble with those at all. But the other group, which is having significantly lower scores and growth factors, uh, growth, growth percentiles are the economically disadvantaged students. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned that there's nothing that's been discussed that as best I can tell really addresses that, especially if part of the reason these kids are not achieving as well is perhaps things outside of the classroom. You know, it's lack of resources at home, lack of extracurriculars, lack of um, maybe poor study conditions and stuff. And, and so I just, there's a lot of kids in that, that group too. And I hope that they can be looked at and I'm, that their needs can be addressed and um, they can get some help with that. So thank you. Thank you. And we will definitely do that. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, to the Gibbs staff for the, uh, you know, for the uh, school improvement plan. Um, I commend you because this is the most difficult improvement plan to write because it's only in one grade school. And so that if you're doing a cohort analysis, uh, it's very easy to go and do an analysis on the students you had last year and apply that universally to the population. That said, I did go through uh, the district data uh, are broken down by subgroup. And that last year's fifth grade and sixth grade showed similar patterns. So I think you're on target of where you're going. Um, your focus is aligned with the data. Uh, good form for a school improvement plan would be to have the data in the plan laid out for folks to to observe but that's okay you've come to the right conclusion uh but my suggestion is for next year as you're writing your school improvement plan and i would expect that you're probably going to be looking at some of the same things that you're looking at right now is to be using this year's fifth grade as a benchmark from which you're drawing your um your action plan and your desired outcomes for for that group because you you're, you've got a whole different population coming in but because of the similarities between last year's fifth grade and last year's sixth grade i don't know how deep you went into last year's data for the fifth grade for last year's fifth grade but your 
conclusions in your action plan does align to what I think are uh, important things for the school to, to focus on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Madam PM Maxwell, please first thank you and please pass on to uh, the rest of your staff uh, the gratitude of the committee for all the work that they've done and continue to do. Thank you so much. I will do I will so I will do so. Thank you. Uh, Audison School Improvement Plan. Mr. Marringer. Your microphone is still off. We should be all set and hopefully I've shared my screen there. So, uh, Madame, thank you very much. Uh, it was, it's always good to follow you. So I will, uh, I will begin um, with the school um, improvement plan here at the Audison. Um, I did want to thank a couple of people that I think have done just a, a fantastic job. So um, Julia McEwen is here with me today and um, she is the assistant principal for seventh grade. Rochelle Rubino could not be here today, um, unfortunately, because she is an adjunct professor at Salem State and she is teaching at Spire, um, administrators who want to get through kind of their PALS process. So we are going to, um, I did want to say to thanks, thanks to them very much. I am having a little problems, hold on with my screen here just for a sec. So if you can just bear with me for just a sec, there we go. Um, we have three goals here at the uh, school improvement plan for the Audison. I just wanted to say the first one is about a bridge program that we're launching. So this is a program that is transitional for students coming back from illness, um, whether it be physical or whether it be hospitalization for social emotional and also for students who are having trouble getting to school with school refusal. The second school improvement goal I'd like to talk about tonight is looking at creating an advisory program at the middle school and the adoption of ruler as a social emotional curriculum. And then the last um, school improvement goal I would like to talk about is whether we um, get rid of tracking at seventh grade. So right now, most of our students take either math seven or math seven A, and I'm glad to let you know that Matt Coleman is also with us um, tonight to ask any specific questions that might be in and around math. So to start off with the first school improvement goal, that is creating a bridge program and launching it. So uh, when I first started here three years ago at the Audison, we had a good amount of kids who were missing substantial amounts of school. So to be in Massachusetts considered chronically absent, you need to miss 18 days, which is 10% of the school year. And for the last three years, we've been above 8%. So when you figure that out, it's about one out of every 12 and a half students are missing 18 or more days. And so we tried to look at why do we have one out of 12 students missing so much time? And what we have found is for many of our students or enough students that we needed to help, they were missing it because of social emotional reasons, um, coming back from physical ailments such as concussions, and because they were school phobic. So we've tried to design a bridge program. And what the bridge program is, is a program that helps students coming back from missing time to hopefully get help both emotionally and academically until they're ready to be full-time students again. So this year we have an academic coordinator that's working with students who are coming back from extended absences. And we've also linked a social worker with that program as well. We have something like this at the high school, shortstop and harbor. And we're really trying to make sure that we're meeting the needs of some of these kids who are struggling. We're also looking to have a bridge program, not only because of students missing, but we're also looking to the future and we're worried about increasing numbers of kids who are 
um, experiencing anxiety or depression. And a lot of times what happens with many of these students is that they're referred to special education and really what they need, I think, is a bridge program a lot of times to get them back on their feet. So just to run you through just a real quick history, that first year we kind of identified the problem that we needed to have more kids transition back. During the second year, we partnered with the Bridge for Resilient Youth, which is out of Brookline to design the program. We made sure we were hiring the teacher and having an exit and entrance uh, criteria, but then unfortunately COVID hit and we were delayed from implementation for one year. And so we've started the program this year and we feel like it's a program that unfortunately a lot of kids are gonna take use because when you look at kids missing school and you look at kids who are suffering from depression or anxiety, over the last 10 years, you are seeing an uptick in kids who are suffering and COVID has just made it worse. So, you know, I think if you look at the data, you're seeing increasing trends of depression, anxiety, a lot with the girls who are in um, kind of 13 or 14 year olds. Um, the good news with that is most, it seems like from the data, most girls are suffering from depression or anxiety, but they're more likely to ask for help. For boys, the numbers seem less, but they're more reluctant to get into therapy and get to get help. So this year we, we have kids in our bridge program. We are tracking monthly attendance. We are making sure that we're collecting all sorts of data. So, so far I think we're off to a good launch of the program and I'm hoping that it really is gonna help some kids coming back from illnesses. Because what we saw kind of before this time is you'd have someone who would be, you know, would refuse to go to school, might have a concussion, might be hospitalized. And the difficult thing is the more time they missed, it got increasingly difficult to come back and get a full academic load. So we're hoping this bridge program will really help some of the kids transition back get on their feet, get some services they need, and get back into the swing about being a full-time student. So that is really our first school improvement goal is to make sure the bridge program is running effectively to help students who need it. Our second school improvement goal is to look at something called RULER, which is the social emotional curriculum. Both Julia, myself, and Rochelle have taken the course. There's some things we really like about it. And we feel like education is changing in that we're really trying to meet not only the goals, academic goals, but we're trying to meet the social emotional needs of our student as well. And we're looking for a curriculum that will help and we're looking for a place to put it. And as many of you know, there's an advisory program right now at Gibbs. There's an advisory program at the high school. There is not one at the Audison. And I think we have to talk about what an advisory program, what would be the goals of it and why we have to um, have an advisory program. And we are gonna have an advisory committee that is going to be um, with teachers because I really need their input and buy in on what it looks like. So there was an advisory program that did start a few years ago. It did, was not successful. Um, feedback that I've received, it was before I was here. Um, teachers didn't think it was kind of well run and in, they weren't invested in the end for the kids feedback. It wasn't seen as super successful. So we came up with something called Aspire which is a 10 minute break, which I think both students and teachers enjoy. It's after the first two periods. It allows kids to catch their breath, get um, a snack, get announcements, get reorganized, go to the locker. I think if when you ask kids and staff, they really like it, but it is only 10 minutes long. 
And I think there are some things in advisory that we could do that needs to be a little bit longer. And we really need to discuss what that is. Um, one of the things that I think is difficult with advisory programs is sometimes they're almost too scripted and they seem too artificial and a little awkward for both staff and for students. And what we really want to do out of an advisory program is have kids connect with adults in the building so that they feel comfortable. And I, when I look at education going forward, I think that the relationships that students have with staff is of paramount importance. And, you know, I look at, we, we had a cross country team this year for the first time, we had about 50 kids. And for many of those kids, they were excited to come to school because they had cross country. And I think kids are inspired and come to school if there are things that they really enjoy. And if we can make those connections between adults, so everyone has a trusted adult and wants to be in school, I think that will be more successful and will help our help with attendance, but also help with learning and academics. Um, and I think though that's an area that we really need to look at in how we do that successfully. Because what I don't wanna look at is an advisory program that to me is too scripted or too artificial. I wanted to make sure that both students and talk to students and talk to staff of really how they feel this can be successful. Um, and I, and I do think that there are some things we can take from the ruler course that Rochelle, Julia, and I um, all were uh, attended this summer. And we feel like there's some really good things that we could take out of that so kids could also talk about emotions and talk about how they're feeling. Because I do feel like more and more we're talking about social emotional learning and how kids are, how they're feeling, how they're how they can be connected to people. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to, to say in, in, in general is that when you have a teacher connect with a kid and inspire, I think that is the most powerful thing. Um, education is changing. For years, if you wanted to know how to do something, you would go to a teacher because the teacher was the keeper of knowledge. So if I had to learn how to factor, or if I wanted to know who in the 18th century was a czar or any of the different subjects, the teacher was the person that I could go to to get wisdom and it could get information. We're switching, and I feel like education is now switching in that you can get content online. I've watched my daughter who's in high school, when she has a question, she goes to YouTube, she goes to Khan Academy. You can get content. But what I see from kids is when they really have that relationship, then they can get inspired and excited about the content. And I feel like that's why social emotional learning, getting an advisory, making sure we have a bridge program is all important for kind of the future of education. The last thing I wanted to talk about, and I think we have to look at here, is whether we should still track math at seventh grade. And so the question to me is, I want to investigate if it makes sense. So when does it make sense to track students for math? So we don't track kids for English. We don't track kids for science. We, we entrust in those teachers that they will differentiate the instructions to reach all kids. Math, and Matt Coleman, I will, I will have him speak to this if he wants to. Math 7 and Math 7A are very similar in what they're teaching kids. And so if it's a similar cur curriculum, should we not track yet at seventh grade? And that's the question. So a lot of this came out of, you know, and Madame talked about this earlier, is looking at some of the statistics and it's really making you think. So if you look at math seven and seven A, seven A is the, the more advanced math. We have two thirds of our kids or 60%, depending on the year, taking a higher level math class. So we have 40 to 33% who are taking the math seven course. If you look at our students who identify black or African-American, it's flipped. We have more, so for example, 
in 2020, 2021, 60% of our kids took the higher level math class, 19% of the African American or black population took the higher math class. 40% of our students overall were in math seven, 81% of black or African American. And the same holds true this year. So it's a, it's a relationship. So the question I would ask is, why is that? We need to investigate. And I think there was a question early on, what about economically um, disadvantaged students? Yes, we need to look at that. The question is, is a course at math in seventh grade, does it make sense to have students to be in there and differentiate? If we believe in, in you know, a growth mindset where every kid can do it, and if we can differentiate and we can give them the tools to be successful, does it make sense not to track in seventh grade? And there are other school systems that are not tracking yet at math in seventh grade. If you wanna look at Wellesley or Weston, there are other high performing districts that don't, that don't track at that level yet. And so if you are tracking at seventh grade, are kids internalizing, I'm not in the upper level math class, I'm not a good mathematician, Magician, and should I should I be not looking at myself to take upper level math courses as I go along? Because clearly I'm not in the upper math cl class. I know this is something that people are looking at, and it is something we want to investigate. So some of the things that we're going to do this year is I need to talk with Matt Coleman and plan with him. We would need to, if we change things, to look at the curriculum mapping for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. We're not trying to lower standards. We're not, we're trying to make sure the same amount of math is being taught. We'd have to create some time so that teachers could differentiate the instructions. We need to get parent involvement and get parent feedback. We need to get the feedback, obviously, from school committee, we need to make sure that we're looking at conducting walks, looking at how we use math support and whether we want to pilot something. So this is, to us, this is a true investigation of, look, we've seen something, does it make sense to investigate? And so that is the third goal is to really look at this. So with that, um, I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Any members of the committee wish to? Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you again. This is a, this is a thoughtful plan, uh, but I do have some questions and an overall comment towards the end. First of all, on, on the uh, school improvement portion of the bridge, can you talk to us about what you would view as a is a measurable outcome or a hopeful uh, achievement that you? data that you'd be able to show us at the end of the year if you're successful? My, my overall hope is that the data would show is that we can have kids that come back from either hospitalization or a school refusal and that they could transition quickly back into a full academic load. So for right now, if one of our students is hospitalized, they've mm. missed maybe two weeks can we in two or three weeks, they come back into the program, can they ramp up and can they go back into classes full time and be successful? One of the things that we've seen sometimes is when kids are school avoidant or whether they're hospitalized, a lot of times the absences just increase and increase throughout mm -hmm. the and what we're looking for hopefully successfully is we can look at students who have missed time and then hopefully we get them up and running in three to four weeks where they're taking more of an academic load and once they've been in bridge hopefully then they have a successful year overall we're looking to try to get our chronic absentee rate under eight percent mm -hmm. and the reason we picked that goal is 
that we've been over 8% for the last three years. Um, and we're worried now with kids coming back from, or we're still in a pandemic, but coming back. And also with the increase we're seeing of um, anxiety, depression, and we're trying to make sure that we can keep the numbers lower than 8%, but we also wanna make sure that kids can come back because I think what's happened in the past is kids have come back in and then they've missed more time. And then they've come back in and they've missed more time. What we're hoping to do is provide structure. So once they come back to school, hopefully they can get the academic and emotional support they need and be successful students. Yeah, understand that, uh, yeah, this is all very important. The, the one thing I'd say is that for us as a committee, because we don't have access to student level data, uh, the MCAS data is pretty obvious. It's published by the state. So that for us to look at a school improvement plan and desired outcomes and to evaluate it and join with you in a partnership, both in terms of resources and next steps, uh, you're going to need to, uh, as the year concludes, come up with some way to measure the effectiveness and or things that you, you envision improving going along. Second question is, how does the ruler uh, program align to Gibbs in the high school? So right now, um, the as the Gibbs has responsive classroom, but it is something that um, Sarah Bird wanted us all to kind of take and to find out. So right now, um, we're kind of piloting the program with the with the teachers, and then we're going to come back and try to pilot it. But right now, it does not. It's a it's a program that's standalone, and we're kind of the first um, group that's in it. I think one of the criticisms that we've had overall in the district is that there, there has not been a continuity and consistency across levels in terms of the way we're approaching both student conduct and social emotional. And with the changes at sixth grade and at seventh grade and at ninth grade, uh, I, I think that we need to be finding a way to align things so that uh, kids are in more consistent in terms of the structure we're setting up. So uh, I, I'd like to see going into next year as part of your evaluation of this goal, uh, how you're looking towards alignment with your adjacent uh, schools. Uh, the third one in terms of tracking math into seventh grade, and I guess it's more of a Matt Coleman question answer comment, is that the research literature shows and student performance all over the place documents that early tracking uh, in mathematics, uh, kids who end up not in the honors track or uh, in lower tracks, that immediately becomes an, uh, a barrier to higher level mathematics when they get up to high school. Uh, so that we're making a decision for kids in sixth grade as we're scheduling them for seventh that locks them either into a path or out of a path to calculus and other higher level mathematics. Um, so I, I really see the need to break down those barriers. I thought that the uh, four by four block offered a passing lane for kids who got into that trap. But I just sort of like to ask uh, Mr. Coleman uh, how he views that particular element of uh, giving kids the chance to get to the highest level of mathematics and not excluding them at sixth or seventh grade. Can, can I jump in before before Matt? Because I, I sure. have I have definitely learned Matt, and I want to make sure that like I am a good student of yours. Um, the, the barriers of whether you're in seven or seven A does not mean that you cannot take the upper level math classes. It does not put you necessarily on a track where you can't. I think where I am thinking, and um, Matt, I will let you, let you um, obviously answer as well, is are kids internalizing because mm -hmm. they are in that math? Matt, I believe you have, like the track is that you can take all advanced courses it just 
there's you've made it so if you're in math seven or math you know you are not all of a sudden tracked for a lower level math you can make that you can still do as well as anyone in math seven i think i'm looking for more of a internalizing you know it's it's a little bit like soccer when you everyone knows who's on the first team and the second team and you're on the fourth team you might not look at yourself as being that kind of player so matt i think i have you know i'm looking at whether kids are internalizing that but the, still with the setup we have today you know every kid can end up at the same point it's just a different pathway am i correct with that matt almost can i add on yeah, really good. So there's a lot of nuance to a lot of this stuff, and I'll try to take it in buckets. So I know I've spoken to all of you about my desire to try to make sure as many of our pathways are open to as many kids as possible. And there have been shifts. And I, uh, I, I think thinking about the end game, I think it's a good way to think about it. When I'm thinking about as students go through our mm -hmm. whole entire system, I am trying to think about what is the typical experience? What do we expect all students to have as their experience? What do we want to mm -hmm. see them end up with? So right now at the high school, I would say we have, we have multiple pathways. We have an AP stats pathway, and we've reconfigured what happens even in our standard level classes. So a student in math six, math seven, math eight, algebra one, geometry, algebra two, can take AP stats their senior year. So that availability of AP stats is still there, which is important to me. The work we've done with our CS program in, in the mandatory sixth grade and the seventh and eighth grade optional class, which this year is 40% of our students are enrolled in one of those optional CS classes. That's really opened up the barriers to that CS pathway. So we have freshmen who are in AP CS principles. You know, some are in honors, which is great, but we have some kids who are starting off that pathway or up the back. The toughest nut to crack though is that calc pathway, because that one, that is the determiner with that math seven and math seven A. And one of the things I worry about is although we have um, a lot of kids, like right now as is, 40% of seniors are enrolled in at least one math AP class, which I think is great. The downside is not a lot of students, even though these opportunities are available to them, not a lot of students, and I think this is to Mr. Merger's point, to Brian's point, there's this, this something that's happening in our community where some students just don't internalize themselves as math students. And they are not taking advantage of a lot of these opportunities. And I'm worried that our systems and our culture is sending signals to some students that some of our classes aren't for them. So my interest in this is really trying to make sure that I'm understanding like all those little mechanisms that could be um, kind of considered. What are the implications of those mechanisms? Like I know on that list, we're talking about math support. I think we're at the point right now, we might be able to kind of retrofit and change math support. So maybe that we can actually start to offer that to students in the math 7A class. Maybe we could actually start to shift around some of our other um, uh, support programs to not just keep that standard level, to make sure that we could actually promote, to really encourage students to take that chance and jump up at that 7A level in seventh grade. So for me, when I'm thinking about this, it's really kind of opening up that final little nut that little nugget at the end of the time for a, a broader audience that we have right now. Um, so that's that's kind of my motivation in all of this. And that's why I'm curious about it. I've painted around the edges and kind of moved around pathways as much as I can. Um, and I do think this is the next thing that I think is really good for us to consider, um, you know, and to, 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 to understand what the outcomes could be for the broader population of our students. Okay. Very much. Thank you, Chairman. Any other, uh, Ms. Uh, Morgan? So I have a I have a question about the advisory, but I'll stick with the math just because we're kind of on that on that trajectory. So, so, um, Matt, are you are you saying so? Are there any kids who take Math Seven, not Math Seven A, but take Math Seven, who go on to take Algebra One as eighth graders? Do we, we close the door to algebra yeah. one for students always, who are taking math seven? Because because yeah, what we, you just said was that what we do when we when we level them in seventh grade is we close off calculus, right? And I know that the path to calculus goes through algebra one in eighth grade. There's there's no way you can't get there if you don't take algebra one in eighth grade, right? There are ways but, around that too. Okay. 
right. right. Um, but I mean, but but most <laughs> students who go on yes. to take calculus take algebra one in eighth grade. All right. So so yes. but but how do you get students out of math seven into algebra one in eighth grade? Yes. So there are multiple ways we've tried to, and this kind of goes with, I would say the bigger push over the, you know, this is the start of my 10th year and this has been something we're trying to massage. So our, our, our tracking isn't hard and fast tracking that we do have those little subtle places to move. So we do have some of our students in math seven who will do really, really well that will open up algebra one. Uh, we do have students who essentially in, um, uh, usually then for those students in 10th grade, where some of the electives in the high school might open up, they'll opt to double up on geometry and algebra two and take the math classes they're elective. Those classes don't overlap so much until you can do that. And then the other thing that we do is the core learning, you know, uh, our state standards, a lot of the, the, the way in which our, the, the new math standards across the country are written has algebra two as that capstone. So those are the ones I hold most dear. 100% of our students graduate our schools through algebra two. There's no one who doesn't. And even at this point, what's great is even through high school, our algebra two classes are all standard level inclusion classes. So when I'm saying that they're graduating with that, we're giving a really good robust education to pretty much all kids throughout the two, which is really a testament to our teachers. But, and this is the caveat, um, uh, but I think we can do a better job of getting, oh, sorry. Well, I, sorry, I forgot this part. We have kids sometimes will take pre-calc during the summertime if they wanna jump into that calc. So we could offer that as well. But as a caveat, those little things are few and far between. And they really are for those very motivated students within those groups. And I still feel as though what I see in the data, and I'd be happy to kind of talk more about it if I had given a little more time. Um, what I see in the data is we're still not sending the message to all of our students um, in a lot of different subcategories. I think it kind of uh, is, is, is pretty broad to a lot of our students that um, some of our math class is for, isn't for them. Uh, and that's what I worry about. So I guess what I would say is, is I, like, I, I appreciate that this is being presented as an investigation. And I hope that part of that investigation is looking at, so I, my hypothesis as you begin to investigate would be that those students who, who take math seven, who go on to algebra one at the Audison, um, are the ones that were, I'm very intrigued by, right? We're, I'm very interested in those are the kids. And, and I would hypothesize that those kids, the reason they choose to go to algebra one um, instead of math eight is because of the relationship they have with their seventh grade math teacher. And that they build a relationship with that teacher during that class, during that year, where for some reason they 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 are they are then committed to going into algebra one because I suspect some of them it's a little bit of a sell right that you got to get them to say yeah yeah I'll take algebra one instead of carrying on with math eight so I hope that you know I I I I think it's important that we're you know we're leveling you know that regardless of what happens with the math seven leveling, um, you know, I think it's really important to look at this because it does seem like a place where if we don't need to level, let's not, right? Um, if we don't need to level to get our objectives, let's, let's not because it becomes, it becomes a barrier to students. Um, but I do want to understand what happens for those kids who, who decide to go from math seven into algebra one what that's about, why, um, you know, why they feel confident enough to do so. And is there anything, is there anything, so I will say, I talked to a parent of a seventh grader a few weeks ago, and she said about her daughter that she was really enjoying math seven this year, because finally all of those other kids got out of the class who always answered the questions first and were always like jumping out of their seats and were flashing their perfect test scores around, um, which they do because they're kids, right? Um, and she was now, you know, toward the top of her, you know, felt like she was like one of the better students in her math seven class. Um, and so it had really increased her confidence. Um, and, and I said to the mom, I was like, you know, like, the material's not all that different, right? Like it's not that different. Um, but but there was a perception for this particular child that that was a good experience. So anyway, as part of the investigations, I'm sure those are all things that you're that you're going to be um, be looking at. Um, 
So my other question for um, Mr. Marringer. So the idea of, of advisory, I guess my concern about it is that ultimately to do advisory, I, I presume you want really small groupings, right? So you're deploying all of your educators in the building to take a small group of kids. And so I will say our experience this year, I have two seventh graders. Um, they're having a great year. Um, they happen to be in an, an advisory class because it's all alphabetical with somebody who they really don't ever see again <laughs> for the whole day. Really nice man, I think. I don't know. I don't know him at all because they, they eat snack with him and it seems great. Um, but I guess my concern is that we we only have so many minutes in the day and if we're taking time in advisory and the purpose is to build relationships with adults there are going to be kids who have an advisory period that's sort of you know um it's been created right to work in the schedule and to have a person who's a hu a, an educator who's leading it and it's not going to be somebody that they ever see again um, during their school day. And I guess I just don't understand the value of that if we're trying to help adults build relationships with, with kids. So I don't know if you can share your thoughts about that, um, but it's, it, it doesn't, doesn't totally make sense to me. So one of the things we're looking for advisory would be, you know, to put some social emotional learning, um, in that time, but it, it's also, you could also have, you know, parts of a advisory that would be interest-based. So for example, if you wanted to have, um, you know, teachers teach what they're passionate about you, and what kids are passionate about, you could also some places have advisory where you go not necessarily with who you're assigned to, but for that block of time, you might go 20, 25 minutes with something that you're really interested in. Um, you know, uh, there's, um, you know, one of the things we, we've talked about internally is about affinity groups. Is that a time period where you could have an affinity group? If you had a 25, 20 minute block, and I don't know what it would look like, how could you meet the goal? And there might be different creative ways of getting there. So some of it might be, yeah, you know, student A always goes to Matt Coleman's class, but there might also be some time where we say for the next three weeks, we're going to be offering, you know, different interest groups. And instead of your um, son going to Matt Coleman's class, they're going to Mr. Hainer's class because he's doing something on history. And wow, they think that's fabulous to go to. And that will be exciting. And, you know, he, your kid's always been a history buff and all of a sudden they're excited about something like that. Um, so we're trying to look at some real creative out of the box thinking of what that would look like. And we do wanna keep things small, but I think that's a valid criticism of what is the assignment of kids and who they're with and how do you maybe mix them up with some of the teachers after a while? Because one of the criticisms of advisory is that is it artificial that you are meeting together as a group and you're trying to connect with that adult? Like maybe there are times in which we need to switch those things. So I just feel like when I look at the overall idea of advisory and connecting with kids? Are there different things that we can do? And I want to get the feedback from the teachers because we had it here. It wasn't seen as successful. Why wasn't it successful? What places are it successful with? And go from there. But I, but I agree. Um, you know, what can we do creatively so that we can meet some of our overall goals and have it be uh, an exciting time in which kids are really like excited about learning and connecting with people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you guys will, you know, do some thoughtful work around this. It just seems like um, a, a lot of that, you know, there, there are only so many minutes in the day, right? And, and we've got to give them, we've got to give, you know, my kids like their snack, um, could they snack and learn about history from Mr. Hayner concurrently? Sure. Um, <laughs> you know, but I, yeah, it does seem like, um, 
you know, I, but I appreciate that, 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 you know, that part of the SIP is not necessarily saying like, we're going to implement X, Y, or Z. And that, you know, that this is a, that, that I think that it's, um, helpful to normalize improvement as investigation, right? Because it is like a part of improving is looking into things and turning over stones and looking to see what's underneath them. And, and it's okay to be like, Oh, okay. Maybe not that one. Right. Um, and I think that that's, I think that that's really important. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. If I try to implement top down advisory, it will not work period. It, it, it won't work at all. Like I need to hear from the teachers who are in the classroom and the students of what they need. And what we're trying to provide them with is, an, you know, hopefully a time in which they're making connections with their, their classmates, they're making connections with teachers, they can discuss maybe difficult conversations, they can, um, Hopefully, it's a real enrich, enrichment and inspiring time. And that's what we're really looking to do. But if I just tell you exactly what it is, it's not going to fly. Like, I, it needs to be, you know, it, there's a reason why a couple of years ago, advisory was at the Audison, and it didn't seem to work. For, so for me to just say, oh, we're going to try it again, because, you know, Brian thinks it's a good idea, it's not going to work. Like I need people to be excited about it, both students and staff, or I'm just, it's just a neat thing for me to go to school committee and be like, oh, we've got this really neat thing. But if there's no buy-in, what are we doing? So that's one of the things we're trying to do to see is if it can be successful. I mean, it's like the same thing with math. Like I have questions. Let's see if we can investigate an answer. Thank you. Ms. Sexton. Thank you. Um, some of my comments are repetitive, but so I'll try to skip over those. But um, I appreciate the, the thoughtfulness around adding social emotional learning programming to the Audison. That's been something that's been missing. And we've heard that, I've heard that from, from parents. Um, but I do share Mr. Schlickman's concerns about the many sort of SEL programs that are out there. Second step, responsive classroom, ruler, collaborative problem solving at the high school. And I hope that there is a plan to make something more cohesive or smooth, um, sort of vertically aligning that. Um, and I share some of um, Ms. Morgan's questions about the size of the advisory group. So that feedback was helpful. But one of the things that it made me think about is the panorama survey and some of your comments to Mr. Maringer around um, students having an adult in the building that they trust. I forget the exact phrasing of the question. It's like, is there an adult in the building that you trust? Um, so I'm wondering if you consider, have considered that, your, the data from that question, previously, and is that something that you'll use um, going forward? I realize you'd have to decide you're going to implement advisory, but I I hope, I agree, I agree with you um, that, have, that every student needs to have an adult um, in the building that they have a relationship with, and it's not always going to be a teacher of one of their core classes. And so having advisory can offer that opportunity for them to for a relationship with a different um, staff member in the building, um, but just thinking about how you're going to um, decide whether or not that's, ha that's happening or the, pro the advisory program is effective, whether it's implementing ruler or doing something different. But. Yeah, I mean, if, if you look right now, you can, you can honestly say like, you have advisory at Gibbs, you have the high school, you don't have it at the Audison social, emotional, you know, what is the Audison doing? And I think that's, we need to, we need to take a look at that and we need to find out what's best for kids. And when we look at, 
you know, and that's what we need to, we don't just need to say, oh, this is a great program. We'll just throw it in. And we say, we're going to do it. Like it has to, it has to work for kids. And when you look at some of the data and the survey we have, I want to say it's about a quarter of our kids said that they didn't really have like a relationship and a trusted adult. And to me, that's too high. And so I'm hoping that in middle school right now, when you can go into school, you feel like there's someone that if you had something, you could go to that person, you could trust that person. And, you know, and for many of that kids, that's happening and they like going to school. But for other kids, we need to make sure that's happening. And so, you know, we're trying to investigate because I really do think education is changing. Like we are seeing kids with increasing, you know, social emotional uh, problems. We are seeing, you know, a switch to more technology. And as our, as the needs of our students change, we need to react. Like, I don't think a school system is static. And we just say like, gee, when I was in school, this is how we did it. It's not, things have changed. And I think we need to look at how we best, you know, meet the needs of our students. And we need to get our students involved. We need to get our teachers involved in what that's gonna look like. Thank you. And I'll just add, um, I appreciate the emphasis that you're putting on getting teacher input into that programming. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Dr. Ampey. Thank you. Um, a couple quick questions. First, the bridge program. So do does either the academic coordinator or the clinical coordinator work to help align the homework loads or get rid of, you know, do they are they involved in communicating with the teachers and managing expectations and and all of this that happens at shortstop and, and harbor in the high school? Yes, so that so that is their role. Their role is to make sure as the student comes back, they're checking in with the teachers, finding out what is the most important thing to do. Because what we're trying to do is get that kid, that student, back into the regular academics and get into a routine. So the academic coordinator is is talking to the family of that particular student and is also talking to the teachers and trying to figure out how best to happen. And so we're worried about the child transitioning and what we're trying to do is have someone who's the adult being the conduit between the family, the student and the, um, and the staff to make sure they're as successful as possible. And that really is the role. So, you know, at Bridge at one time, we're looking anywhere from six to eight students we're looking to have on that caseload. And the idea is that it's transitional, not that it's a, a year long process where, where they're in. But yes, the, the idea is the academic coordinator is talking with the staff to find out what is most important to get them back in the class full time. Okay, I, I think it's been a program which has been very successful at the high school and very useful. Um, and I can see a need for it at the middle school. Um, I think the readout, one of the readouts that Mr. Schluckman was looking for could just be what percentage, you know, what percentage of the time have students been in school? Um, and we only have historical data now, but you can compare it with that. And uh, that that's a useful um, metric just to begin with. Um, then my other question was just, just to offer an alternative view about the differences among the SEL programs. Kids respond differently at different ages and it may be that one program is better for younger kids or, or older. Um, and also sometimes these programs put things in, they phrase it differently. And so one kid may pick something up in one where they don't in another. So I don't think it's totally unreasonable to have a mixture of programs across the district. It would be nice to get, and this isn't for you. Um, I'm looking at you, Mr. Berenger, but it's not you, um, it'd be nice to have a sense of what the programs are at all the different levels and what the strengths and, and 
um, downfalls are of each one and why we do which one where. Um, but that's something that would be later. And, and again, it's not something that you should be doing. It'd be more um, uh, as bird or, or someone else in the administration. So um, that's all. Thank you very much. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Merringer, for a very am ambitious SIP. Um, this is, so this is our first time looking at the SIPs for each school. And I, and I think, um, you know, part of what's taking so long tonight is you've got a lot of big ideas in here that we haven't really been exposed to before. And so suddenly seeing them in the SIP, we all have <laughs> strong thoughts on some of the proposals. And so um, some of these probably need to come back for more discussion, either at a subcommittee or the full committee um, or during the budget process. So um, I'll, um, I have lots of thoughts on lots of these, but I'll try to keep my stuff brief. Um, uh, so the, the bridge program, it looked like that started in September 2021 this year. So is that already underway? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. So we already started the bridge program. So this is great. That, yeah. That's great. I, I didn't see that discussed in the budget, budget discussion last year, though. So, so did, were we able to fund these positions elsewhere from somewhere else or? So we funded, um, so going back pre-COVID, which seems like a lifetime ago, we had a teacher here who fulfilled a lot of different roles. One of her roles was that she um, gave some extra help to kids. One of her roles was that she did in-school suspension. Another role that she did was that she made sure kids were catching up when they went, um, came back from extended absence. She retired, so we repurposed her position to be in the bridge academic coordinator. We were also given a social worker this year as an extra position to help with a lot of kids transitioning back. And when we took the social worker's position, we said not only would that person be working with a caseload, but they would also support that person um, in the bridge program because a lot of those kids need counseling. So one was pre-COVID repurposing a position we already had, and one was adding a general ed social worker. So for years, the only social workers we had were you needed to have an IEP. Otherwise you were going to your school counselor. And we thought that there were many kids who would, and when we talked in school committee, thank you for funding the position. Um, we felt that there needed to be a general ed social worker. And so that was a lot given to us. And we said some of that would be helping out and giving counseling to the kids who are coming back from hospitalization, but might not be on an IEP and have services. Great, thank you. And then on SEL, I mean, I, I do recall Ms. Bird saying she was working on a SEL map for the district. So I don't know what happened to that, um, but I think that would help put all of this in context and put our minds more at ease if we could get her to come. We've got a pretty booked agenda through through the new year, but in the new year, if we get her to come and update, update, update us on the work that she's been doing, that I think would, would help put, put Ruler into context, because uh, I know she's a big supporter of that. Um, and then, you know, with, with, with the math restructuring, um, I mean, partly you've got so much going on. Um, I, I, I do think doing all of this this year to run a pilot next year in, 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 this, in this area is, is um, I, I think it's too much too fast. So I definitely support exploring this idea, investigating it. Um, but I do think once you make a decision that this is the direction you want to go in, um, you're gonna need a lot more time to rebuild the curriculum. I mean, math support just changed from uh, to transition to algebra last year. So we're gonna change it again in next fall. You know, I, 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 I would think we would wanna go a little bit more cautiously with this. It, you know, it, it, I'm not saying I, I'm against it, um, I, I do think there's a lot of data here that shows that we're unnecessarily tracking in the seventh grade. Um, but I do want to make sure that when we make the shift, we do it right. And we, we make sure that the teachers are able to differentiate correctly. And the kids that need support with keeping up with the curriculum are getting the support, keeping up with that actual curriculum uh, somehow. And then maybe it's not math support, maybe it's TAs in the class, I, I don't know. 
Um, but I do think we need more time to, to build a program that will work for everyone. Um, and then I'm, um, you know, we still still have the, the skip math program, the skip sixth grade um, math program that, that I, I think you, you introduced Mr. Coleman, um, if I'm correct. Um, and I just, I, we need to understand the impacts on that as well, right? So if we're eliminating the chance for kids who um, wanna go faster in the seventh grade, are we going to be forcing more kids to, to try to get into this skip math program? There's just a lot of questions that I think we need to investigate before we, before we go forward with this. So that's all for me. Thank you again. Yeah, and I think you bring up some good points because what we don't wanna do is rush anything. Because I, I think we want, to, we want to be thoughtful and we want to make sure that we're having these conversations with all the stakeholders. And yes, I, I agree, it's ambitious. I don't know if we're getting, you know, it's a goal. Um, you know, we're hoping to make sure we're doing the action steps and move on, but it, it might not be, you know, something that we get to. And, you know, we understand that, but we're gonna, we're gonna try. And then I think the, the conversation will be whether, whether we're, we're ready or not, and if that's what the investigation turns out. So, um, you know, I, I think we're pretty realistic right now in looking at it and wondering what we need to do and can we do it? And it might, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we can, but I, I, share some of the same kind of thoughts of we need to look at a, a lot of things. Um, but, you know, I think it's something worth investigating. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I'm going to be brief because a lot of good material has been covered. You know, first of all, Mr. Marriage, I think that the three objectives you have are, are right on and the things that the school should be addressing this year. So I applaud that. The, and, and I think the conversation that you and Mr. Mr. Coleman and the, the rest of the district uh, or best of the math teachers and, and you wanna have is actually a good thing to have. And I actually think, I mean, I heard Mr. Coleman say in, a, in the subcommittee meeting the other night that um, the other day that this is the, you know, that, that it might be better to begin the, to get rid of leveling in uh, or, or have heterogeneous classes in the seventh grade or earlier. And so I would think this might be the grade level to begin what was talked about at the curriculum meeting the other night regarding uh, heterogeneous classes. So this might be the level to begin at. So I'm glad you're doing it. What Mr. Cardin said is probably good advice. And I think you're considering it anyway. You don't want to rush it and you want to do it well. So that's Thank the you. only point I want to make. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Merringer. Thank you and thank you all, all your staff for the work they've done and continue to do. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Okay, superintendent's report, Dr. Holman. Okay, you should be able to see my screen, yes? Yes. All right. Good evening, members of the school committee, and thank you. And thank you to our school administrators who took the time to be here and share their school improvement plans. Middle school night was a lot of fun and it was great to hear what they're working on. Um, and the two of you also can get going at any point if you would like to be dismissed and have a good evening. I know you have a busy day tomorrow. Um, and actually not, not two of you, there's a lot of you there. So thank you all for joining and thank you to Mr. Coleman for joining as well. Um, I want to give a brief update as it regards our COVID-19 um, situation and numbers in Arlington and in APS. We have had four cases so far this week in Arlington Public Schools, so we're continuing to have a low case numbers across the schools. Um, we are working to make sure that the dashboard is updated regularly. I thank families for their patience because it usually takes me um, or takes us until the weekends to get some of the pool testing data up, but we do try to keep the case counts up to date as possible throughout the week. Arlington's average daily case rate uh, was posted earlier today and it's stable um, compared to last week. So uh, it looks like over, overall, both in the schools and in town, cases are stable. Um, I don't anticipate a change in Middlesex County's um, status this week. And as I mentioned last time we met, that is tied to the town's consideration of dropping a town-wide mask mandate. Um, additionally, the commissioner issued uh, a revised uh, deadline for the dropping of the mask requirement 
to January 15th. I, I critically uh, want to make sure I note and did not note in what went out to families that there is still a waiver process if a school has a case rate above 80% or a vaccination rate above 80%, then school districts may apply for the waiver. Uh, we are not in a situation where we can consider that right now because we are still under the townwide mask mandate that is linked to Middlesex County's case rates. Um, however, we could begin to consider a uh, revision if, in, if we ended up in a situation where we fell down into low or moderate categories. That said, we're considering a lot of different factors, including the fact that our youngest students can't be vaccinated. Many of them have older siblings. Um, the fact that uh, the upcoming holiday season is on its way here, as well as flu season, and all of these things would play a role in conversations that we would have with um, the Department of Health and with our nursing team in considering any sort of application for a waiver ahead of the January 15th potential date. So that's just an update on um, COVID-19. I also wanted to update the committee on the work being done towards my entry plan, just as a quick snapshot of what um, I've been up to. I'm holding some fall family and staff listening sessions. Those are set to begin next week and they have some focal themes attached to them that are coming out of the listening sessions that I held earlier this summer. These will be themed around diversity, equity, and inclusion. The staff forum I'm actually holding with our director of diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of her entry plan. So we're just gonna hold a, a joint staff um, listening session. Also some themes um, around partnering with families and community. Um, how we allocate resources as we start thinking about budget season and the rollout of our budget process. I would love to hear from staff and families about how we should allocate resources, about how we support staff. Um, and uh, one of the listening sessions for staff is about professional development and teacher leadership as well. I'm also getting started on student focus groups. These are scheduled at all levels and I can't wait for these. They're, they're going to be a lot of fun so that I can talk to the students themselves about what they love about school um, about you know how um, what they love about their teachers, what they love about their classes, and also what they would like to see change in their school experience. School visits are underway. I had the pleasure of visiting several schools this week um, and seeing classes with principal and talking about instruction. Um, and fall family, student, and staff surveys are currently in development, and I will attach any questions about my leadership to those panorama fall surveys. Um, I do want to name for the community and the committee. Uh, that we do continue to have hiring challenges along with everybody else in the Commonwealth, um, every other school district, and honestly, a lot of other industries as well are suffering from hiring challenges um, and shortages. We have currently 41 open positions posted, which I say publicly um, to just let everybody know that we're actively hiring for multiple positions at all levels of experience. And please share if you know anybody who is looking for employment, we would love for, to have you join the APS uh, community, especially if you really enjoy working with little kids. Um, so please do share, please let people know. Um, we are working to recruit as best we can and, and getting creative as best we can. Also acknowledging that we're not the only ones um, who are having this particular challenge uh, and that this is a neighbor, this is a mirrored challenge in our communities nearby. Um, a couple of quick good news items as well to share that we will be providing grab and go lunches on all school days, including those early release days when we maybe previously had not served lunches. Um, we're able to do this because all lunches and breakfasts are free to all students. Um, and I also wanted to remind the community that we are serving breakfast at all of our schools this year. Uh, it starts at 745 at the elementary schools and a little bit later at our schools that start at 830. Um, and the students are welcome to get some breakfast if they would like to upon arriving at school. Um, it is a slight adjustment to provide the grab and go lunches from the school committee voted calendar. We've made the adjustment on the Google calendar um, and we're glad that we can go ahead and provide some lunches for students as they leave. We will revisit whether or not this is possible as we develop plans for next school year. Um, and I also wanted to share that we're preparing for COVID-19 vaccination clinics throughout the district. Those are going to take place in November and we will have dates locked in as well as locations as soon as the approval for vaccines for ages five through 11 comes through. Uh, we'll send information to families as soon as those vaccines are approved so that they can go ahead and sign up for these. The health department's emphasis is really being heavily placed on preparing for COVID-19 vaccines. We have held a couple of flu clinics, um, but we're probably 
not going to hold a lot of those in the next month because we're ramping up to make sure that we're able to provide the COVID-19 vaccination clinics. We sent a survey out to families to get a sense of how many of them would take advantage of this and the response was overwhelming. It looks like a lot of families would go ahead and take their students to our clinic. So we wanna make sure we have the capacity to do that. Um, and that's it for my update for this week. I will happily take any questions that the committee has. Anyone on the committee have anything? I just noticed that uh, Amy uh, has joined us, a student representative, and I would invite her if you have anything to share with us tonight, other than saying hello. I don't think I have much to report besides that most fall seasons are coming to an end here. So okay. hopefully, hopefully me and Megan will be able to show up to more of these meetings consistently. <laughs> I know it's tough. Thank you very much for coming. Of Appreciate course. it. To be with a bunch of oldest. So. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mason, financial report, please. Good evening, school committee members. Uh, this evening uh, in, uh, in Novus was the, included was the period three financial reports. The period three financial reports um, are reports for month ending September 30th or date ending September 30th. Uh, we pulled all the financial reports as of that date. Um, included in the packet is um, the reports for the grants, the revolving and the school committee appropriation, uh, which we call the general fund. We also have included in the report, which is different, is um, I will I separated out the COVID-19 related grants. There were some additional grants that uh, we were funded through the American Rescue um act and we also included um grant funding for the which was recently accepted or one of them was recently accepted and then there's some pending for the electric bus we were recently awarded uh for the from the epa um an additional three hundred and twenty six thousand dollars to cover that um electric bus project um so overall, I'll start with the general fund. The general fund uh, or the school committee appropriated dollars. We are currently reflecting a excess balance projected of around $1 million. Uh, this $1 million is, is mainly driven um, between two elements. Uh, we have budgeted a little bit more uh, out of district students um, than what we, we currently have. Um, my understanding is we're around 70 out of district students. Uh, that's lowered from 86 that we had last year. And we were budgeted, I believe around the 80 number. And then the other thing is what Dr. Holman recently stated in her previous, her superintendent uh, report, which is we are still trying to hire. And so there's, cost savings reflected because those positions are not um, encumbered as of yet. Um, and there will be cost savings as when we do fill those positions, you know, there'll be the half of the year that those positions were not paid out. Um, so that's what drives that uh, excess. Go moving on to the grants report, all the funding and many of some of the grants just recently got set up for this fiscal period. Uh, we will are still in the process of setting up some a grant such as like SR3, which um, we've presented to this uh, committee many times or several times. And what's different this month is that I put asterisks next to the grants that need your approval to uh, to or acceptance for a mass general law. So if that motion could be made to accept um, the, the grants with those asterisks. So that would be the, cons the Consolidated Health Services Affiliated Grant, the Integrated uh, Learning into Academic Learning Grant, um, the EPA uh, grant for the electric school bus, the Fund 252 ARP IDEA, which is tied to the, the COVID-19 related funds, and also the ARP IDEA for early childhood. 
Um, the spending plans and how we have them budgeted are also in this report. And then last but not least is the revolving fund report, which once again, uh, we're spending as planned um, and there's nothing major to report. So overall, we're in a good financial position. I will now open up to any questions if there are any. Dr. Ampey. I move acceptance of the grants that were named by Mr. Mason earlier. There a second? Second. second. Is there any further discussion regarding uh, the acceptance of the grants as presented by Mr. Mason? Roll call vote, Dr. Rampey. Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous acceptance. Are there any questions or comments on the rest of Mr. Uh, Mason's report this time? Thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, Mr. Schlickman, MASC Delegate Assembly. Uh, Delegate Assembly is next week. Um, I have uh, asked the uh, uh, resolutions that, that will be before the uh, Delegate Assembly to be posted in Novus for your perusal. And we'll happy, happily listen to any comments either now or going forward as this is uh, discussion among members of an association, and it's not a direct uh, uh, school committee item. And Mr. Schlickman indicated that uh, if members, uh, you can attend on a hybrid basis if you're not going down. Am I correct, Mr. Schlickman? Yes, you can register and attend sessions uh, on a hybrid basis. I'm going to be helping MASC with the, uh, with the technology on this somehow. I think. Does anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to give to Mr. Schlickman at this time regarding the MASC assembly meeting? Thank you for being our representative, Mr. Schlickman. Appreciate it. Uh, moving on to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the event, the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22093 by $809,607.27 dated 26, 2021. Minutes from regular school committee meeting on September 23rd, 2021. Minutes from regular school committee meeting on October 14th, 2021. I entertain a motion of acceptance of those three. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Thank you. Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous. Subcommittee and liaison reports, budget. Um. We met today, we had discussion about additional positions which will be presented by the um, superintendent at a later meeting and also about thoughts for the upcoming long range plan meeting. And now I'm going to have to go because I need to drive. I'll be listening in, but I'm gonna be driving so Jane, um, Jane or Lynn, if you could chime in if I forgot anything. Be safe. Ms. Morgan and Mr. Carden, do you have anything to add? <laughs> okay, put you on the spot. Community relations, Ms. Exton. Thank you. Um, we met on Monday with the directors from the after school programs, both in APS buildings and within the community. Uh, we heard about enrollment and wait lists and a need for more space and challenges with getting staffing. Um, and then we had a conversation about policy KFD, which relates to surplus space and after school programming. Um, and so we will 
it sounded like the consensus from the subcommittee was that we wanted to have a full committee discussion about the changes as opposed to sending it to policy. Is that, Ms. Len, Mr. Curran? No, I mean, I thought the issue, the issue is, is eliminating some of the data that's required by that policy, mainly, mainly the financial data. So I guess the, the consensus on the committee was to delete it. We don't really need that financial data about these programs. Um, but if anybody disagrees, then, then we should have the discussion. Yeah. <clears throat> Might I suggest you pass that on to the uh, uh, policy committee and then they can hash it out with the rest of us. Okay, that's, that's fine. Suggestion. And I'll, it was, I also just want to point out, it was also about consolidating the dates of the superintendent's report. Um, and then the other piece is there will be a school committee chat on Saturday, November 13th at 11 a.m. Um, anyone is welcome, but it is um, especially we are inviting uh, families of students in special education or on 504 plans. Um, interpretation will be available. And there is a there was an email sent out by Ms. Diggins, and I will have her send another one before the deadline of November 5th um, to sign up if one needs interpreters. Mr. Thank Thielman you. and I are going to be the school committee representative. That's right. Thank you. And Ms. X and Jeff said she'd come and help us. That's a good idea. Good strategy. Mr. Schleckman. Uh, did uh, Ms. Exton say there were two policies she wants us to look at? It's one policy. K F D. J F K. K J F A. Okay. Thank K you. K as in kite. K JFK. AFD. D. D like donut. AFD. Send him an email, Liz. Uh, email. I will. I will. I will. Yeah, okay. Surplus okay. space, Mr. Schlickman. Surplus space. The one we use to decide to evaluate the uh, use of the after school programs. Yeah, I just want to make sure that there's just that one and there wasn't a second one in there because it sounded like there was more to talk about. Y'all said, Liz? I will eat. Yes, I will email you, Mr. Sim. CIAA, uh, Mr. Garden. Thanks. So we met on Monday. Um, I'll bet one of us were, were there, but I'll update us. I'll update for the community. Um, we heard a brief update on the Deeper Learning Dozen, which is going as planned. We heard about plans for a non-residential science week this year in light of the pandemic and the closure of the Alton Jones camp. Uh, Science Department head, Dr. Sam Hoyo, is working on plans for Memorial, likely Memorial Day week that will involve experiential learning for our fifth graders centered on watersheds in the community, uh, ending with a game with game or games of predator and prey. Uh, there's interest in the subcommittee on further exploring the longer term future of Science Week, and I expect we'll discuss that more uh, up, upcoming in the next year, in the new year. We also heard um, about further work being done on the issue of heterogeneous grouping at the high school. Um, they've hired a consultant to work with them on this and presented some initial data regarding the 2020-21 experience. There'll be a series of community forums before any possible ideas for a pilot are developed and brought back for review. Um, community members raised a variety of questions and concerns, and we have an open offer to have an additional meetings on this if desired by the administrative team. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policies and procedure, Mr. Schlickman. We'll be scheduling a meeting as soon as I get an email from Liz Exton. <laughs> Thank you. Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We meet uh, next Tuesday, November 2nd. And uh, at that meeting, we'll get an update from the uh, design team uh, on the progress of the project. Anyone have a liaison reports at this time? Announcements. I would just like to remind the committee, you received an email from Ms. Diggins uh, with a request for me to look at uh, as subcommittee chairs that survey for the remote participation uh, committee. They're looking for data uh, going forward. This time I will entertain a motion uh, for executive session uh, to vote to meet in executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Law 30A Section 21A for the purpose to discuss strategy with respect to litigation 
spe specifically litigation associated with dissolution of EDCO, uh, litigation associated with dismissal of an employee be because an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation positions of the committee. As far as I know, and I'll stand corrected, we will not be coming back to open session. So uh, is there a motion? So is there a second? Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Rampey? Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous. So we will now enter executive session.